So uh, I'm typically presenting to a technical crowd. Today is kind of a little bit of a different topic. So I'm going to present around um, API and open banking frameworks, uh, the history, where are we going, and the implication of this. Uh, and then I'm going to conclude in terms of reference architecture from the perspective of uh, Red Hat. So why am I here? So beside being uh, an engineer uh, by study and also um, being specializing in computer science, I've also had a uh, big interest into economics. So I'm an avid reader of uh, The Economist. I've been taking several classes online. Plenty of you did mm, or know uh, Coursera or EDX. So uh, in gamification, game theory, uh, micro and macroeconomics. And at the same time, <coughs> Uh, three years ago, I joined uh, Treescale, uh, which was a small startup in Barcelona uh, around API management. And this then got acquired by Red Hat, which now also got acquired by IBM. Um, and more recently, I've been involved with Red Hat uh, in the open banking team. So I was uh, traveling through EMEA, presenting around uh, open banking uh, an open banking roadshow and leading the technical workshop for it. So these two elements came together uh, as of today, so, and uh, that's why I'm today presenting this. So why are you here today, besides being interested into API management? So I hope you are in the right room. I, uh, I understand there are three sessions running at the uh, at this time right now. And really what I, I'm trying to achieve today is to maybe uh, leave you with uh, an interesting fact uh, or something that you could re reuse in your daily life around open banking. So how really did we get here? So this is a definition from uh, Wikipedia. I think they updated it uh, recently, but the important part is that besides the disrupting factor of fintech, um, really fintech is trying to enhance the functionalities that traditional uh, banking is uh, providing. And when we think about fintech, maybe most of us, uh, we think about the most recent uh, innovations, so blockchains or uh, WeChat, something like this, but really fintech is any financial technology as we speak, right? So this started uh, way back uh, in the 50s, so it was the invention of uh, our common use credit card, uh, and most recently uh, foundation of uh, PayPal, uh, which is uh, already almost 20 years old. Um, and uh, also, most recently, the first um, text payment. So through Nokia, there was the, the first, um, a first can of Coke was bought uh, back in the 90s. So as we can see, mm, FinTech is, isn't something that was born in the last uh, five years. And open banking is just building on top of uh, this type of innovation. So, I understand that uh, we are, you guys have already seen a lot of these maps showing uh, the different frameworks across the globe. Um, so I'm not gonna go into the details. Also, the European details are quite boring. They go ahead for a thousand pages. Um, my interest is to just highlight, uh, so what you see underlined as the uh, interesting factors and differences between all these uh, standards. So the EU one is considered to be like the, the oldest one. It's also the one that doesn't really provide any uh, uh, detailed technical recommendation. So uh, it's more about the approach uh, and the way that the interaction should be between banks and uh, what they call uh, TPPs. So there are these new actors coming on stage. So the relationship between 
customers and um, banks is now uh, mediated by these new actors. Um, and the other important thing is that the consumer have to provide explicit consent. So the consent management is an important aspect. Um, and also, of course, a strong emphasis on strong uh, customer authentication. So then you have the UK, which uh, built on top of uh, the EU, the PSD2 directive. And they actually got into more details. So they were uh, much more technically detailed about how you could uh, comply and achieve uh, this compliance. They now actually have a full suite of uh, testing tool to which the banks can check if they are compliant. Uh, the important thing is that the mm, uh, UK standard was applicable only to this uh, or mm, uh, was involving only these nine major banks. Um, and there are two additional elements that are interesting. So the first one is the fact that the banks are also responsible for the availability of their service towards the uh, end user. So they have now metrics in the UK uh, that they have to expose around the availability of their banking services. And the fact that there is also now a security uh, profile that's involved in uh, interacting with these APIs. Then you have Singapore. So in this case, as you can see through the slides uh, that I'm going to present, um, not all of these countries have strict uh, standard or regulation. So in some cases, we have guiding principles or suggestion coming from the government or the monetary authorities. So <clears throat> for example, in this case, in Singapore, we, have, we don't have really a compulsory uh, regulation and framework. We have more kind of a suggestion. Um, and this is trying to um, push the banks towards innovation. So I'll, I'll get to a conclusion around why this is different across the globe uh, when I finish this part. Then you have Mexico. In this case, as you can notice, um, they're actually forcing all banks to comply with the regulation that will come out. So they're basically saying that any bank that doesn't comply with this model will be basically pushed out uh, of the financial market in terms of uh, consumer uh, uh, bank. And the other interesting fact that is something that um, the banking market in Mexico, I would say in South America share with uh, African one at least, is the fact that they're not uh, looking at monetizing the APIs. So this is something that's very relevant for UK and uh, EMEA market. Uh, in Mexico, it's more about uh, including new customers into the banking world. So you have plenty of users that are under bank, so they're not taking advantage of the full possibility offered by banks, or that they don't have even access to uh, network. So they, they cannot really use even the APIs because they don't have internet coverage. That's something that of a revolution uh, for open banking that will affect also, of course, the uh, telco field. So these two revolutions will come together. Then you have Australia. So in this case, the important aspect is that open banking framework is part of a, a bigger picture. So the consumer uh, digital right framework. And in this sense, this is uh, in some part, in some ways similar to the GDPR revolution or uh, norm um, in the EU. Um, so this is uh, really focusing on bringing the power back to the user in terms of uh, control on his data. Then you have Hong Kong, uh, which again has uh, a regulation and Japan, which doesn't have uh, compulsory regulation, but it's aiming uh, with a date and a set of uh, uh, timelines to have most of the bank uh, using open API approach to manage banking. And more, most recently, New Zealand uh, this year actually came up with a strong directive towards their uh, biggest uh, payment provider and is basically kind of uh, forcing it to open up 
its uh, APIs. So as you can see, uh, we didn't touch the US um, and other bigger countries like China. Uh, so uh, the US, in this sense, is kind of uh, lacking behind. So it's uh, kind of a far west. So that the government, uh, in this sense, doesn't want to regulate, or maybe it's afraid to regulate uh, and stifle innovation. And China uh, isn't depicted here, but is actually one of the most uh, innovative country in terms of uh, uh, digital payments. So maybe to me or to other people living in, uh, in Europe, this is not known, but uh, to you, I'm pretty sure it's known the fact that uh, you can pay with a QR code. Um, and the uh, non-cash uh, transactions in China account to, to a very huge percentage. So related to this, there are, there are side initiatives. So as I said before, uh, regarding China, we have several um, payment platforms that have been out there already for a while. Uh, and there are other frameworks that are uh, kind of uh, taking advantage of the fact that now we speak openly about open banking and it's, it's like a cool thing to speak about open banking and then the W3C uh, came up with a um, seamless way to pay through your browser. Uh, plus other European countries now have uh, a bank ID that you can use uh, globally. So um, like kind of uh, your digital identity. So as I was mentioning before, how does this really relate uh, to FinTech? So we have here a list from, from our research from Thomson Reuters about um, the potential for growth in terms of uh, market for uh, FinTech companies. Um, and it, as you can see, the, the list doesn't really uh, reflect one-to-one -one, uh, the open banking regulation. Um, so. And also here you can see that the amount of non-cash transaction I was mentioning before. Uh, this is another research. And again, as you can see, the list, which is actually uh, kind of outdated, so it has already three years, and China is sitting third. But I'm pretty sure it will sit first uh, in a few years. So what does this mean? This basically means that <clears throat> every region has its different uh, approach and its, its different consumer sentiment around open banking. So while you might interview people and banking user in, uh, in EMEA and they would be scared about sharing their personal data and personal transa transaction with uh, new FinTech, in China that's perfectly fine um, and it's uh, common usage. Um, so it really depends uh, on also on the impression that uh, end user have of banks and of digital privacy. Um, so through all these frameworks, um, we can distill a list of basic requirements that are needed once a bank wants to make this move uh, towards being open and uh, towards um, start dealing with external parties and external partners in an API fashion. So of course, um, first point would be REST APIs, plus all the um, requirements around security. The, so the strong customer authentication, um, um, the other uh, element that guarantees security, so preventing screen scraping, um, uh, asking for explicit consent, from end user, um, plus all the requirements you see here. And how does this translate? So um, this doesn't really uh, ask banks to buy a set of uh, platforms or, um, or components. So basically, uh, banks can build their own uh, architecture and infrastructure uh, centered around this functionality to guarantee the fact that they will comply no matter which country uh, they're dealing with because these are uh, general principles 
uh, that are common across uh, the open banking frameworks. So a point that I didn't mention, but maybe you saw in the slide, is the fact that several countries uh, have taken as an example for their open banking initiative the UK one. So you'll see that as soon as more government start uh, dealing with this, they will most likely uh, use as a base the, the UK one. Um, so how does all this component translate into a practical architecture? Um, so the important element here is that um, with this kind of digital transformation, you also have uh, a cultural transformation. So uh, the, the architecture that I'm gonna show is definitely associated to an approach uh, related to microservices, to uh, fast deployment, um, and to, of course, uh, DevOps culture. So um, all these things that maybe banks are not so used to, they have uh, kind of more internally regulated environment, uh, but it's something that they should strive to achieve, first of all, in terms of culture, if they want to uh, map onto this type of architecture. Uh, so you start, of course, with the API management layer, um, with all this uh, basic functionality. Uh, so anything from developer portal to interact with uh, your partners up to API contracts and API rate limits to make sure that nobody's uh, overusing uh, your services. Then you have the security layer, uh, which is protecting you against uh, bad actors. Uh, and this is interacting, of course, with the API management layer. So you have all the parts around authorization on usage of your uh, PST2 APIs, and also the consent management that's achieved through an IDP platform integrated with API management. And then you have the integration layer. So, of course, you're gonna have uh, basically two waves regarding your backend service. You have new service created from scratch that are gonna be based on microservices, hopefully. Um, and you have a set of functionality related to these microservices. So typically, you wanna stream uh, all the events uh, to later analyze, for example, uh, for fraud detection purposes. And then you have your old uh, architecture that might stay in place for maybe another 10 to 20 years. You don't wanna throw it out the moment you start doing open banking. So you want to integrate with it. So you also might plan for an integration uh, and adapter uh, platform. Finally, you want to have all of this sitting on top of a pass platform typically, if you're dealing with containers and microservices. And this provides you additional value because it comes with a set of base functionality like monitoring, uh, clustering, auto-scaling, um, logging, and networking functionality that otherwise you'd, you would have to build on your own for uh, communication between your microservices. And this, of course, then, um, it's protected by your external security layer, uh, which can be a WAF or a load balancer. And the interesting thing is that uh, this type of architecture is valid for any kind of uh, um, actor or uh, partner. So it doesn't matter if it's new TPPs, your old uh, banking customer who is accessing your services through uh, mobile bank um, or even internal developers. So the great thing of this is that you can reuse the same architecture. It's just a matter of uh, different configuration in terms of API management. So why also I think that open banking and open source go well together? So this is just a list of uh, elements that uh, I would argue that they both apply to, to both worlds. So in terms of rate of innovation, possibility to exchange components, so interoperability, uh, usage of standards, um, security, so security is definitely key in this world and you 
don't really want your own custom closed source security protocol or implementation. Uh, and also, of course, low barriers of entrance. So you might start with your internal initiative with a small set of microservices, and you might not want to, to buy a full big platform and uh, start implementing everything. You might want to try with an open source version and uh, start implementing step by step internally first. Uh, this is just to remind what uh, the banks are dealing with in terms of uh, competition. And some of this uh, is already current, so nowadays uh, basically banks are used to this type of competition. Some of, other, of this other um, competition is going to come in the next year. So I'm, I'm pointing at the last two on the list. So uh, the application of uh, cryptocurrency to money transfer and to smart contracts. So where to? So at the moment, uh, well, there, there was a first wave of fintech that uh, we can associate with, uh, for example, Mint, uh, which was a data aggregator um, I think 10 years ago, um, based on screen scraping. So if, if a standard user gets into the detail of what really screen scraping, screen scraping does, it's uh, uh, kind of scary. So basically, they're, they're taking your own banking details. You trust them. They, they will not use them maliciously. And they're just pulling the transactions, really. Uh, so this is actually uh, banned uh, inside the EU framework. And some other frameworks will likely ban this type of approach. And we'll actually propose the, the API-based approach, of course. Um, so this will also uh, involve a new wave of fintech. And the banks, I think, that are trying to fight off because it happened. Uh, there was a manifesto around uh, leaving screen scraping as a, uh, an open technology to share data uh, will just uh, wither and die, in my opinion. So drawing some uh, parallelism, so what happened in the telco world? So in the last 20 years, uh, there was a lot of um, regulation about openness in the telco world as well. And um, especially in, uh, in Europe, there was this concept of uh, mobile number portability. So uh, we started being able to port our numbers between operators. And there was a research. You can see here the result. This basically brought to the end customer savings and, in general, uh, benefits. So what, what this really implies is the fact that if a bank is just relying on uh, offering vanilla uh, service without um, any additional feature, anything that will really entice the end customer, uh, it's going to lose the customer, and it's going to lose the customer even fast, at a faster rate than before. Um, but there is also. I would say still a positive side for uh, those banks that may be behind and uh, will start their journey just now. So even though most of the end users, especially the young ones, they would be willing to bank uh, with uh, the, the likes of Amazon and Google, um, most of you. Uh, will not really, maybe even after the recent news around uh, Facebook breach, will not really share uh, all their data with uh, such type of players. Uh, so most of us, in terms of end user, we still trust uh, the bank with our transaction and uh, payment data more than any other uh, sector. So in this sense, the, the bank as traditional banking still stand for uh, trust. So we still have a high level of trust uh, in the way that they manage our account uh, 
and um, they kind of protect uh, the money that's been really stored there. They have also a scale that even though um, Ripple and the likes are trying to uh, publish themselves as the, the fastest network, they still have a, a scale that's not really comparable to any new technology in this sense. So, and finally, they have <laughs> what you call magic. So they're basically at the same time, they're taking your money uh, and they're making it appear in several different uh, customer accounts, loaning it to several uh, customer at the same time. And this is something that even with new technology, uh, it doesn't apply really. So the moment you uh, complete a blockchain transaction, well, that money is really gone. It's officially gone. Uh, so um, that was my overview of uh, what's going to happen to uh, banking given the PST2 and the open banking regulation. And I just wanted to conclude with uh, uh, three short quotes that I think are relevant uh, to this uh, type of discussion. So the first one is that uh, banks are not really disrupted by new technology. So new technology has been there for a while now. So banks are really disrupted by the expectation of the customer. So the customer which is uh, optimizing his trip with uh, Uber uh, or optimizing uh, his uh, shopping with Amazon is also thinking about optimizing banking. Why not? So. Um, Banks should be mm, really aware of uh, putting the customer at the center of it. This is another quote which is quite famous, and the important thing here is that uh, this, this, is not a, this is not a recent quote. Uh, it's a quote from the 90s. And the fact is that for most of the functionality for which we use banks, um, we're just interested into the functionality. We're not interested into the paraphernalia that comes along with it. So, um, and then finally, this is uh, to put the accent back to security. So, uh, we possibly not uh, gonna be really um, confident about the fact of sharing my detail account to a platform like Instagram, because we expect more securities, of course, on transaction and accounts than we expect on, on selfies. Thank you. Thank you, Luca.